Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Every, hey, welcome back to another episode of Grief to Growth. This is a podcast where we explore the profound aspects of life, death, and what it means to truly live. I'm your host, Brian Smith, in case you don't know me. And whether you're a longtime listener or for joining us for the first time, I'm really grateful that you're here. At Grief to Growth, we dive into the deep mysteries of existence, drawing on both personal experiences and insight from a range of voices. Having navigated the heartbreaking loss of my daughter, Shana, I've gone through the depths of grief and emerged with a renewed understanding of life and life's incredible tapestry. And I like to share that with you. That's my, that's my goal. Today, we're venturing into a fascinating conversation with Serge Bennington Barons. He's an individual whose life story is as compelling as it is transformative. Serge was born into privilege as a son of a Russian princess. He embarked on a path that led him from a world of wealth and ego-driven pursuits to one of profound spiritual awakening and authenticity. In this episode, we'll explore how Serge navigated his soul's journey, transforming his life into a force for positive change. We'll delve in the significance of inner work for all of us, the process of releasing old patterns and attachments, and the journey towards healing the heart. We'll also discuss his encounters with diverse sages and healers, his book, Amazing Grace, and his insights on how to live a life aligned with one's soul beyond the constraints of traditional religion. By listening to this episode, I'm hoping you're going to gain valuable perspectives on personal transformation, overcoming ego, and the power of self-discovery. It's a conversation that I hope promises to inspire to challenge to inspire you to challenge you and offer you new ways of seeing yourself in the world. And Serge has got some insights on what he thinks is going to happen over the next 60 years for all of us. So make sure you stay around to hear that. And after you listen to the episode, head over to grieftogrowth.com slash community and continue the conversation there. So with that, I want to welcome Serge Bennington Barons. Hey there, Brom. Good to be here. It's it's great to have you here. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you about your your personal journey, your spiritual journey. Now, I know you started uh, with, with a life of privilege as the as a uh, son of a Russian princess. So, tell me what it was like growing up. We had eighteen servants for my father and mother and me. So, um, so I was cosseted. I was sort of cosseted, and I had a lot of style and famous people around me and sort of members of the royal family, because royals like to hang out with other royals and celebrities. But I felt like um, a pea in the wrong pod. I <laughs> felt I, I wasn't in the right tribe. My soul felt unfed. My ego got fed, um, and I went to all the best schools and Oxford University, and but I didn't want to be part of that superficial kind of upper classery world that kind of Prince Harry and has also escaped from. And so um, when my dad, who was a rather um, um, a sort of a tycoon, you know, my dad was a tycoon and he wanted me to be a tycoon and he was really sort of, was always making me wrong because I wasn't more like him. Hmm. And so when he died and I was 23, I could start on my spiritual journey. I said, I don't want to be part of this rich set. So I gave a lot of money away um, and, and somehow my soul now had a chance to come to life inside me. It had had to be oppressed. I had to wear this false mask of my, you know, my persona, the socialite and good. 
with, you know, cocktail parties and dinner parties with smart people and smoking jackets and Gucci shoes and all that shit, man, as they would say. Um, and then I was able to start my real life. And a lot of it happened when I went to California. That was the time of the human potential movement, which was a fantastic movement, much more important, Brian, than um, the Haight-Ashbury, um, where all the visionaries from, from Europe, they all converged in California because they felt, yes, sort of here is where the space to be free to to develop my thinking. Interesting. So, so I got, I was very privileged to hang out and even work alongside some of my spiritual heroes like Ram Das, Joseph Campbell, um, Moshe Feldenkrais, Fritjof Capra, because a group of us started an institute for the study of conscious evolution. So, so suddenly from being in my artificial world, I was in a world of people whose life was saying, I want to make a difference. We need new paradigms. We need new ways of exploring the universe. And what I'm now finding as I'm nearly 80 is that sort of many of the ideas that I'm working and writing in my books now and teaching, because I teach a lot of seminars and webinars, still work as a psychotherapist and help people, you, is that they were all birthed about then and they haven't much, to, you know, and sort of what happened in those, in the 70s and 80s in California was an incredible sort of movement for transformation. And, and I think that we're now seeing it beginning to work because in a way, mm. Brown, the counterculture didn't work. I think because the planet was not in as bad a state as it is today. So that we were all sort of visionary new ages, a great new world of Aquarius was going to unfurl and there would be love and light and peace, man. It's all beautiful, you know, sort of hang out with beautiful people and, you know, the musical hair and, mm -hmm. and kind of, um, and we were all a little bit naive. And I think now the same movement is happening, but we've woken up a little bit and realized that, that, that the world ain't sort of quite as sort of beautiful as it's turning out. And we're now having to face the dark side of the planet. We're now mm. having to face the evil side of the planet. And we're particularly seeing it, Brian, in your wonderful country, where um, I think you're, um, if Trump gets in, and he may well do, and God help the world if he does, um, if you have some Trump listeners, I apologize, you know, sort of to you. Um, but um, I think there's going to be a lot of challenges in the years ahead. So how about that for an entree, Brian? Excellent. I love it. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Thank yeah. you for that, hey. for, that, for that great introduction to the conversation. I do want to ask you, at what point, because, you know, most of us did not yeah. grow up with material privilege and we, we, we think that would be the best thing ever. At what I point know. did you realize this is not what I want? This is just doesn't work for me. Well, because I wanted to be an ordinary person. I wanted to find my divine ordinariness, mm -hmm. but I was always mixing with people who were kind of, sort of lived in their ivory towers, the rich, the rich and the celebrities, which sort of, um, and for me, the kinds of people I was meeting did not make my heart sing. Mm -hmm. And sort of wealth can be a terrible, terrible trap. And that's why when I, 
I had inherited from my father and I had to get rid of a lot of his money quickly because, because it, can, it can trap you into not doing anything. You know, just as poverty can trap you, you know, that sort of both polarities can be very entrapping. But um, um, I, yeah, it was not a world that I felt at home with. And I think it was kind of interesting when my dad died and I went to his funeral of all the celebrities and royalties and famous people and tycoons, not one person said to me, hey, Serge, your dad's died. Can I help you in your career as a young man? Because I was, because I was just 23, I just finished Oxford. Right. And I felt, yeah, you know, they're not my tribe. I don't belong in this world. Interesting. Now, I, yeah. I I always hesitate to get political on the program because we're supposed to be a, we're a spiritual program. And people jump on me all the time about me mixing politics with, with what I do. But we have to admit that Donald Trump is a world figure, a, a world-changing figure. And people around the world are focused on what's happening in America right now with politics because of because of this person. Um, and you're you're about of his age, and we're born in similar circumstances. You know, he's he's kind of royalty, American royalty, uh, yeah. a very privileged, uh, wealthy person. So, what are your observations about someone like that who came from a background similar to yours? Well. He's become a cult figure, and often cult figures are extremely sort of manipulative people. Um, I, um, a, um, a Polish psychologist invented the term a pathocrat to, to discuss sort of world leaders who are psychopaths, um, uh, um, narcissistic, um, inflated, and paranoid, and I think that he comes in this, in this, in this clothing. But because of the particular sort of myths of your country, i.e., that the American dream was over, um, is over and gone, and. Only the super rich seem to benefit from it. And a lot of people in your country feel ripped off. And he talks the language of victimhood. Look, the, the inner, what does he call it, Brown? This inner state, this, the... Um, oh, deep state, uh, the deep state. Yeah, the deep state, yeah. Yeah, the that the deep state, I'm going to be your sort of retribution. And so he poses as a kind of Svengali figure, sort of larger than life. And it's very interesting that even the, um, um, the fundamentalist Christians are really going sort of, you know, for him and sort of sees him as a Christ-like sort of figure where he's going to sort of lead them out you know, and the waters will will part, and he'll and he lead them to the holy land. Mm -hmm. And so, because of the false narratives and false and falsehoods that are being sort of propagated, if you repeat, you know, something that is untrue enough, people will will believe in it. So I think that he embodies both the wounded ego of America plus a sense of, you know, disappointment that life has not turned out the way it should have done. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that has to do with the great conspiracy in the world that no one really points out and which Trump is very much part of, i.e. that... It's really been a conspiracy where the poor have had to pay for the rich sort of getting richer. And I don't think that the poor need to be given more money. I think that they need 
that the system needs to change sort of whereby the money that should be going to poor people and education and sort of and sort of sort of medicine is going to make the super rich even richer mm. and so perhaps your wonderful country if he gets in will have to sort of face its nemesis because civilizations they 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 ebb and flow and i think that we're seeing the end of one kind of civilization and um, a book was written in the 70s about america a world power or a rogue nation and i think your your beautiful country that has given me so much and i have so many american friends is a world power but it has a dark side and that dark side is is a roguish nation i mean america has started more wars than any other country yes yeah you know? and if and if the little countries don't agree with you know what's what's in it for america geopolitically they'll get bashed on the head yeah that's well uh... well we've We've gone a long way from amazing grace, but I would just like to say that I think there is an amazing grace or a fierce grace that mm -hmm. is that is present in all this, sort of whereby only if we face the darkest part of our souls, both as an individual, and of course you in grief to growth will understand this very well only if we face the darkest part of ourselves individually and sort of nationally are we going to heal because i think we've got to face the dark side or as a as a character in a thomas mann novel said if a way to the better there be it it lies in our taking a full look at the worst and i think that 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 is what's happening to a lot of people and a lot of nations. Yeah. Well, let's let's get back to your to your spiritual journey. Now, you've my you've, spiritual journey. <laughs> yeah, you you've gone through a lot of different types of, of of philosophies and things like that. And you even made a comment in some of the information you sent me that you've studied a lot of things and maybe some people might say superficially as opposed to one thing more deeply. So, how do you how would you respond to that? Well, I feel um, I've touched into many different traditions. I've been with Sufis, I've been with Buddhists, I've studied sort of mystical Christianity. I've, you know, I've been out in the desert with shamans, I've worked with psychedelics. I've, I've done a lot of different things and it's mm -hmm. given me a, a, a broader view because they all complement each other. Um, those true paths that look to find the infinite in the finite or that really try to look at, at discovering our soul sort of nature, that they all have something in common. And I've taught workshops all over the world and I work with individuals and it's really great because I have all sorts of different arrows in my quiver and many different perspectives that I can give than um, if I'd just been a Buddhist or just been a Sufi. So, um, so all the great traditions, they all talk the same language but they all sort of emphasize sort of different things like shamanism is more you connect with nature sort of christianity you connect more with jesus yeah it, we're, i think we live in a very interesting time because i was talking with someone about this the other day you know yeah. the world is getting smaller something happens in in russia right now and i hear about it on the news 30 seconds later you know, we, we live in a time where the world is so we could and you know, it used to be if you were even a Catholic, like living in America, you might live in a Catholic neighborhood and all your neighbors were Catholic. So you never got to know anybody who was even a Protestant, certainly never a Hindu or a Buddhist. But now we we can learn from we know all these different traditions. And I think they all have their strengths and they all have some maybe some weaknesses. Exactly. Um, so I, I, I love and I've studied very superficially a lot of different traditions also. 
Um, and I can take the best from each of them. And I think that yeah, I think that's why the world is coming to the place we're coming to now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um I think that that the only solution is a change of consciousness, an uplift of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I don't like the idea of a reset because it means we're creating our future in the image of the past, in the image of our present society. But mm -hmm. our current narrative, the way that most institutions work, is not going to create a future. We have to shift the level, or as Einstein said, the solution to problems doesn't happen at the level of the problem, but at a higher level. We've got to create a new, a new narrative for, for politics, for economics, for how the world is going to work. And I call that an upsurge. Humanity has to raise its consciousness. We have to move beyond desiring other people's property. We have to move beyond envy and um, and aggression. And we have to look at the, the um, hostility in the bottom of our hearts and our fear of people who don't see the world as we do, our fear of... of of immigrants, our fear of people whose skin is a different color from ours, our, our fear of people who believe that God is different from the way that we see it. And sort of basically my whole thesis and my whole sort of life work is about the opening of the heart. Because when we open the heart, then the opposites become reconciled then we have a natural compassion and an empathy. If my heart is open to you, Brian, I can feel my being into your being, so I understand what moves you. And actually, my heart is open to you, and I feel you a very tender and loving man. And if my heart is closed, I won't see you in that way. Mm. I won't be able to to sort of walk in your shoes. And that's the new consciousness that's needed, an opening of the human collective heart and, and sort of maybe this is going to happen when things get so bad that we realize that there's no choice but just to start loving our neighbors as ourselves. In fact, the last chapter of my book um, amazing grace. I look at the future and I say that I think, to quote you, out of the incredible grief that is going to happen, a lot of growth is going to happen. And I believe a new society will come into being, but not without a lot of struggle. And I certainly think that if about 5% of people can really awaken their hearts in a big way mm -hmm. that that there can be a quantum shift in consciousness in the world. And by the way, I just want to say, and I always like to say this, I believe a lot in, in being of service. And if there's anyone who's listening to this program would like to have an hour with me, no charge, just get my email send me an email and say, hey, Serge, I disagreed or I agreed with what you said or I've got this problem. I'd like to talk with you. I'd be very, very happy to talk with you in a therapeutic or a political or whatever way you'd like to talk with me. So please be in touch. Thank you. And, yeah, it's very generous. And, and it's not really generous. It's just that I think we all need to be of service to our fellow human beings in the way that we're best able to be of service. I don't go into the rainforest and confront the guys who are sort of chopping them down. I don't go in a little dinghy and confront the Japanese whalers who are killing the whale. That this is that this is my way that I can help people. And it and it actually makes me feel good. So I just 
sort of really want to to put over the idea that the more that we can be of service mm-hmm. to the emergence of a of a new consciousness and a more humane world, the more we benefit our own spiritual and psychological growth. Yeah, absolutely. So your your vision for the world, and I do want to I want to get into that a little bit later on, like your because you talk about what you think is going to happen over the next sixty years. What's that based on? Is that based upon just your observations of humanity? Is that based on some spiritual insights you've been given? Why? What is it you're you're basing that on? Well, I rely a lot on insight. I don't call myself a psychic, but I do have insights, and a lot of people who whose work I really respect also have the same sort of vision as I do. Mm-hmm. So I feel that I'm not a, a lone wolf crying in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. Um, but my experience with people is that change often doesn't happen unless there's a lot of suffering. I just made a recording which which people may want to see on my YouTube channel called Fierce Grace. And I have had fierce grace come into my own life. Mm -hmm. And it's been sort of with me in the last year as I've had to deal with um, some some chemotherapy. And And it's knocked the hell out of me, but it's been very good because it's really allowed me to tune more into the healing power of nature, get closer to my darling wife, and closer to my dog, and closer to animal and nature consciousness. And it's actually had an awakening effect on me. Mm. Hey there, you know, life's got its ups and downs. And sometimes it feels like we're navigating through a pretty thick fog of grief. But imagine if we had a bunch of friends walking with us, shining their flashlights, helping us find our way. Well, that's the dream I've been working on, and it's finally here. It's the Grief to Growth Community Circle. It's a place for like-minded individuals where we support each other. It's chock full of resources and exclusive content. And guess what? It's free to join. The main part doesn't cost a dime. Just head over to griefforgrowth.com slash community, hit the apply button, and bam, you're on your way. I love what Ram Das says. We're all just walking each other home. I can't wait for you to join, start sharing stories, and growing together. Let's light up this path one step at a time. I'll see you on the inside. And so I'm aware that when we really go to the end, when we go into the darkness, that the light emerges at the end of the tunnel. And so I, f- I feel that sort of, that there are helping forces in the dark things that are happening in our planet at the moment. Mm-hmm. And, and we can even argue, Brian, that, that your Donald Trump is an instrument of fierce grace. And I think that he's come to do an important piece of work for the planet, if not to awaken a lot of people to the fact of of his loathsomeness. Because I think that one human being, I can't think of any (laughs) other human being who combines all the traits that are most not needed if our world is to move to a better place. It's a very interesting observation. Um, and I, you know, I I try to help people understand. I think everyone is here to teach us something. Everyone's here mm-hmm. to challenge mm-hmm. us. Everyone. So when, mm-hmm. when someone challenging comes into your life, as opposed to yep. opposing that person, it's like, I look at, try to look at what are they here to teach me? And, yep. and Donald Trump is someone that, embodies i'm going to say it the very dark side of america 
And yeah. we're and and you know, sixty percent of our country looks at the other thirty or forty percent and says, "This is not who we are. This is not." And and that part of the country saying, "Yeah, this is who we are." You know, this this man is who we are. This is the 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 slogan: "Make America Great Again." You know, going back to what they perceive America to be. So I I, I agree with you. I think that you know it's really interesting when we look at bad people mm -hmm. in our world they're here maybe to teach us something and 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 you said something real also really important thing about how people don't seem to grow unless there's some sort of pain involved um it, my my whole program grief to growth it's like we take that yeah. that 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 pain the, the chemotherapy even you know and it makes us go deeper it challenges us and 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 it, it moves us forward it makes us go deeper i think that, that the whole social media sort of paraphernalia, it superficializes us. And our challenge is to go deeper. For me, spirituality is not sort of sitting on a sort of mountaintop saying, oh, and being able to make other people wrong because I'm more enlightened than you. But spirituality is just a question of going deep and treating our fellow human beings in a kindly and appreciative and respecting way, whoever they are. That, for me, is what being spiritual is. Um, I have talks with, with people who belong to a community called the non-dual community, they love to make me wrong that I don't feel sort of like them, that, um, that I'm, I'm totally in tune with the infinite. I say, I want to be a human being. You know, I'm here on earth. I don't want to be some sort of um, kind of sort of guru-like figure who, who, who is above everyone else, is that... We need to enter more deeply into our humanity, and that's what being spiritual is for me. Yeah, uh, that, I, and I, I feel wanna... that that's probably for you and the lovely program you do. Yeah, I think you just said something really, really important because this whole idea of non-duality—that that you know we are all one, and there's no dark and light, and and so. And I have I have an old friend, and every every time I say this, I think about him. So I give credit to, to Mike. It's like there are different levels of of reality. We live in a dualistic environment. You know, it's like so. Sometimes people will say, "Well, there's no good or bad." So then people will take that so far and say, "Well, then that means nothing I do is wrong." And I'm like, "No, on this level, we have rules, right? We we don't torture babies. So we can't say from a spiritual perspective it's okay to torture babies. No." We have different roles on different levels, and we are here to have a human experience. We are here to feel all of the emotions, not just not just peace and love and light. We're also here to experience challenge and fear and darkness. That's why we incarnate it. That's that's my belief. Absolutely, absolutely, Brown. Yep, yep, and. Um... And I think that we're at a very interesting point in, in, in history. And I think it's also important at this time that we remember to smell the flowers, that we don't get pulled into, say, Trumpian catastrophizing, that it's all so terrible. Because that's the main narrative and and especially it touches a lot of young people. Yeah. Sort of luckily, I have um, a young 24-year-old daughter who's who's quite a cool girl. And she's not touched by that narrative and she feels positive about life. But so mm -hmm. many young people are touched by this catastrophizing that it's all terrible. Um we need to 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 allow the joy and the and the celebration of life. And I think that we live in a world that is based on 
the polarity between success and failure. And if you have qualities like you're pragmatic, you're a go-getter, you have a good commercial sense, you're materialistic, then you're successful, and then you'll make it some. And all the, <clears throat> what I call the transpersonal or unitive qualities of joy and kindness and, and, um, and beauty, they get sort of left behind as not being important. And um, I think the world is going to be saved by joy and beauty in the end. And, mm. and, and it's very interesting. I think that the artists and the musicians and the, and the poets and the, um, and the jugglers and um, that they're the people who are doing most to heal to heal the world. And so let's not forget, after you've listened to this program, sort of anyone who's doing this, go and meditate on beauty. Find the things that make your heart sing. Go and hang out with a good friend. Go mm. and um, um, give something to a friend of yours who is in, who is in trouble. Read a beautiful poem. Yeah, well, you play the guitar. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because you we were talking about how bad things are, and I I realize almost universally if you say to people, the world's in terrible state right now, almost everybody will agree with you. The world yeah. the world is terrible. There there are wars. There's poverty. There's there's you know yeah. all, there's etc. But statistically speaking, the world is not in a worse place than it's ever been. Poverty is actually global poverty is actually exactly. going down. I, I, I and I've said this to people as when when Hamas invaded Israel a couple of months ago. It is terrible. It's awful. It's it's horrible. But compared to World War II, it's it's like nothing. You know, the six million Jews died in World and just just Jews. And then I looked up how many Germans and and British people died in the bombings that were going on. And then the Japanese in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So things are in a way getting objectively getting better. But what I think is happening is human consciousness is saying, this is wrong. This is, we're finally starting to say, we're not going to accept this as normal anymore. And I think our consciousness, as you said, you mentioned earlier, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, probably no more than that. Wow. 50 years ago, we thought we were ready for this revolution that, that I think you foresee coming, but I think things kind of do have to get worse in a sense or people perceive that before we're ready to make that transformation? Maybe why the 60s turn on, tune in, sort of drop out, sort of didn't work, was because the world, because the global crisis was not as bad as it is today. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't the same urgency. There's now a sense of urgency, but I agree with you, we have to balance the dark and the light. And um, I think I think it was some rabbi who said something to the effect of dance your painful dance on a sea of joy and sort of how can we bring the dark and the light and the light together. And so we're not going up into the light and, and escaping the darkness, but we're not just going into the how terrible it all is, but that we sort of we sort of dance between these opposites. I think that that's the great challenge, and I think that that's the challenge in my life, um, because I've had a lot of sort of interesting um, sort of challenges and sort of difficult things have happened. I'm sorry that you lost a daughter. I don't know how I would be able to deal if I lost my only daughter, but but I can see that that it's made you a brave and sort of loving man to have gone through that tragedy, and um, and I really take my hat off to Brown. And Thank you. Um, and um, I think that that we have to be open to face the worst and hope for the best. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I want to s- switch gears a little bit here. I know you, yeah. you talk about the keys to living a, a content life or a, a happy life. So as after, with your age and your experience, what would you, what would you say to the audience? What are some of the keys to being living a content life? Okay. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing some essays for my new book. That's going to be called three chord man. And I'll tell you why in a moment, mm-hmm. but an essay I'm finishing is the challenges of getting older. Mm. And, And I think the key to living a good life is to have love in our life. And not everyone has it, but if we can be part of a community, that's really, really important. When I came to California, I was part of a spiritual community of like-minded people. So community is important. Mm. I think that, I think that we need to keep in good physical shape. I mean, I do a lot of sport every day. I keep in good shape. I go to the gym, I work out. Um, And I think we need a good relationship with animals. It's Mm. so important. Mm. And, and, um, And a good relationship with nature, because there's something so beautiful and healing about animals and nature. And I think that we need to work at opening our heart and emptying our heart of the pain and finding what makes our heart sing. I mean, I'm working as hard as I have ever done in my life, not because I'm some sort of um, sort of workaholic, but I, but I love to work. I love to be with people. I love to teach. I love to write makes my heart sing. Mm-hmm. And so I think that those things are very important because um, there's that wonderful sort of story that Joseph Campbell talks about how when he was a student, he was in a cafe and he saw a couple sort of having lunch with their son and their son, and he heard their son say, oh, mom, I don't want to eat that, that meat. And the father saying, come on, you need to eat it. And the mom said to the father, can't you see he doesn't want to eat it, honey? And suddenly this touched the father and he stood up and shouted at the whole restaurant, I've never done anything I've ever wanted to do in my life. Hmm. And a lot of people don't do the things they want to do. Wow. And that applies to a lot of very wealthy people who are stuck on the materialistic thing to earn more money. And I've had a lot of very wealthy people as clients, and they're no happier than the rest of us. So that we need, we're lucky if we can find our thing. And if we can't find our thing as our main work, then let's do the things outside our thing that makes our hearts sing. Let's have a hobby, something that we like. Mm-hmm. Sort of let's play music. Let's 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 sort of collect stamps or whatever it is. So that it's about being creatively involved in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, obviously you're doing something right to to be in the in the shape you are, at, you know, at, at 80 and and to be the the passion that you have about what you're doing. I mean, to, I I hear you say I'm writing my next book and I'm like, "Wow, okay." Um uh, because I've written one and I'm trying to get get around to writing the next one, but I, I love the the passion that you have for what you do, the passion you have for humanity. Um and you you said you're not doing this for for money, you're doing this because you want to contribute. And what makes your heart sing? I love that. Books don't make you money unless you're Deepak Chopra or Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. And I ain't either of them. (laughs) You know, I'll tell you what my next book is called, Three Chord Man. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you how I was at a dinner a few months ago and, and talking about music, sort of 
with a woman whom I didn't know. And she said, Serge, are you a musician? I said, no, I'm a three chord man, i.e. I play the blues and, and all you really need is three chords to play the 12 bar blues. And I'd never really advanced beyond that, but you know, I play a bit of blues. Mm -hmm. and so, and then a friend of mine sort of heard me say that and said, Serge, that's the, a good name for your next book. So my next book is going to be called Three Chord Man. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. And so what's that book going to be about? Well, it's going to be about um, sort of letters to my daughter about mm. how I feel the challenges that I feel that she faces in growing up and about our relationship. Awesome. I'm not an intellectual, you know, I'm a kind of feeling person. And um, so, so yeah, um, it's going to be fun. Like yeah. sort of this book is fun. It's, um, I just say a tiny bit more about it mm -hmm. is that it's fun. It has all sorts of stories like, you know, about the dev scene and the upper class scene in England, because I was at Oxford, you know, at a time that it was a little bit sort of Downton Abbey-ish, the world I grew up in. Uh -huh. And and it's also about my spiritual journeys and the things that the seeker has to look out for. And I wrote it because I think, Brian, we all need to tell our story in some ways or 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 other. Um, you know, either to a person who loves us and sees us, or through music, or sort of telling our story is our way of finding out who we are. Yeah, yeah. But speaking of that, that reminded me, I had a client that um, we worked together for several months. And what she would do, we, as we start working, because she wasn't sure what she really wanted to work on, yeah. work, work with me. And she said, well, I want to leave a legacy for my grandchildren. So she figured that out. And she said, I want, she said what I want to do is I want to tell you my story. So we would get together every week. And she would just, she started from the right. time she was a child. And she just, she would continue the next week in our next session, our hour long sessions telling me her story and it was so fascinating i learned so much from it for one thing but as she went back and retold the things that had happened in her life because she was trying to write it down for her grandchildren but just reliving it in her mind just opened up it was just wild watching her transformation as she just simply told her story so i think that's really really important for us to do and also to tell our story to someone who sees us and listens to us. Yes, yes. Because if we, because that allows us to tell our story. Like I can go to a party and I can bump into someone. In fact, I did once and they said, oh, sir, you know, now tell me about yourself. What are you up to? You've got rather long hair for someone your age, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Sort of tell me what you're doing. You know, into that space, there was nothing I could say because the person was not interested in my story. Right. But if we meet someone and they look into our eyes and we feel they care, not because they know us, but just because we're a human being, and they say, what makes your heart sing? And we feel heard and listened to, and there's a kind of love there, then we've got a space into which that we can empty our beingness into and in doing so that we can discover it. Mm -hmm. And there's something sort of lovely about you, Brian, because I feel your love, that it's part of your nature. I feel a generosity in your being and it allows me to tell my story to you. And so just sort of being with you and hanging out with you feels quite healing. Well, thank you. I appreciate thank you. that. Uh, I um, it, it's funny because we talked about the the non dualist before. <laughs> I I do believe that at some level we are all one. We are all connected. That I am you. That you are me. We are all God living through these various avatars, 
facets, whatever term you want to use. And so I love connecting with other people and I love hearing their stories and we can all learn from each other's stories. You know, I don't have to go through it. That's one of the great things about humans. That's one of the reasons humans have survived the way we have, because we don't each, every generation doesn't have to learn knowledge over and over again. We can, we can share knowledge with each other and we can not just technical knowledge, but also what's your experience been? What did you learn when, when this thing happened to you? What was it like being a super wealthy person? You know, uh, I think it was Jim Carrey that said, I wish everybody could become famous and wealthy so you could realize that's not where happiness lies. Because a lot of us are pursuing, we're pursuing fame, we're pursuing wealth, thinking that's what's going to make me happy. That's what's going to make me happy. But all we have to do is look at the people that have it, you know, people that win the lotteries or people that are born into that type of wealth, that they're not any happier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're into the question, what makes us happy? I mean, that's the great mystery. And I think it's really important what sort of makes us happy. And I think, although I've told the things that sort of make my life work, I think it really boils down to a deeper connection with our own divine selfhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if I can, and, you know, I don't want it to sound all sort of spiritually kind of, um, but, but I think when we connect to ourselves that there's a sort of happiness because we're living with an us that's more real. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we live with an us that is more superficial, as I did for the early part of my life, um, when I was a professional ski racer, I enjoyed that, and the girls liked it. You know, a lot of my early life was being really superficial, you know, and I would sort of work out and get great muscles so, you know, I could parade on sort of beaches and girls would like me and I'd be this cool ski racer. But mm -hmm. it didn't really make me happy. Yeah. And it didn't, um, it sort of, it kind of fed my narcissism. And a lot of my life, dear Brown, has been about recovering from sort of being extremely sort of narcissistic, which is actually a way which is a which is a residue for unhappiness. And again, if we return to our great um um orange hued blonde bombshell that we've been talking about, I can't think of anyone more unhappy and who looks more unhappy than poor Donald Trump. I feel sorry for him a lot of the time. And yeah. I know people that, that yeah. know me well will, will probably be surprised yeah. by that, but I, I do. I yeah, I do as him. well. Yeah, 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 I do as well. What makes you happy, Brian? Um, what makes me happy is I, I love teaching. I love helping. I love sharing with people. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think people like you and I, we come into the world and I felt like I didn't connect. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, why am I here? I feel like I'm on the wrong planet. I, I was born in like the early sixties. So I remember being a little kid and turning on the TV and seeing the Vietnam war. And I thought, what is, what kind of place is this where people kill each other on purpose? Yeah. I, I just, I never understood that. And why do we have money why don't we just why don't people just work and then give away and you know i i thought it should, be, it should be a barter system if anything um what what makes me happy is seeing people reach their potential seeing people wake up as to why we're here i would say it's like where did we come from why are we here and where are we going so helping people answer those questions yeah. what is what is yeah. the purpose of your life you know um how do i take whatever I've been given, whatever that is. And how do I, how do I make the most of that? Um, I love, I love doing this. I love when people, you know, reach out to me and say, I listened to your program and it, it really helped me. Um, I think, I, I think you and I are, are agree with like, we're here to help each other. I think that's people say, what's the reason why we're here? 
we're here to help each other. Some of us, I think, are yeah. more awake in this dream than others are. I think some of us are still very much asleep, and some of us are here to help those other people wake up. So that's what I like to do. And, well, I mean, it could have been me saying that, and I think that because of that, I have a lot of good spirit in me, despite having been ill. And I found, and I found a really interesting thing that despite having been quite ill this last year, my spirit has never been stronger. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, that we need to think about the spirit, but we need to work on ourselves. I wrote a book before this called called Gateways to the Soul, Inner Work for the Outer World. And by the way, guys, I would love you to buy my books because all the money goes to a charity and I'm now paying it to a charity to help the Ukrainians. But I've got... Hmm. Um, but I can never find my... Um, yeah, but I wrote a book, uh, the book before this, was called um, um, Gateways to the Soul. And the book before that was called Awakening the Universal Heart. And I'm not just trying to sort of promote me, mm -hmm. but all the money, if you buy Serge Beddington Behrens' books, it'll all go to a good cause. And sort of maybe that you can get something out of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, um, so yeah. So please do because um, I just, because I don't want to make money sort of out of doing this. So so yes, the challenge of the world today is yeah is to realize more and more our interconnectedness. I think. I think that the problem is that too many world leaders are hyper disconnected human beings and they've come into their positions of power because they've been cunning and they've had an emptiness that all disconnected human beings have inside them. So they wanted to fill it with power and status like sort of Netanyahu with power and status and fame. And then you realize that these leaders don't care about their people. They just want to be seen as great people. Again, yeah. the orange man, does he care about his MAGA crowd? Not one iota. He just wants them to care about him because he feels so empty inside that unless he's continually being fed from the outside, that that, that emptiness comes back. So, so how can we create a world, Brian, where we have good human beings in positions of power? I ask myself, how did Martin Luther King succeed in doing what he did in America? How did Nelson Mandela sort of manage to affect the transitions he did without there being a civil war in South Africa, my explanation is that both had such big hearts that they were able to hold the whole of their nations inside them. Hmm. Wow, that's and beautiful. And that's, that's what's needed. How do, we, how do we allow our hearts to grow so that they can encompass more of the world outside us, inside us, so that I can um, encompass people who are completely different to yeah. myself. I'll tell you, Brian, I was brought up to be very prejudiced and homophobic, and, and Black people or Asian people were non-goers in the world that I was brought up. And we used to sort of imitate them and tease them. I mean, it's horrifying. Mm. It's absolutely horrifying, I look back on that. But it was a gift because 
I was born with all the worst things about the patriarchal sort of male sort of mindset. And mm -hmm. I've had to heal that. Mm -hmm. I mean, all my friends, when I was young, they were all sort of white, upper classy kind of people like me who yeah. spoke, you know, this with the same English accent as I. You know, it's it's yeah, really interesting yeah. you say that. I'm I'm curious. I I, I always get to this, and I it, yeah. God, I, bro. do you yeah. do you do you believe that we plan our lives before we before we come into this incarnation? That we choose, for example, are the, the circumstances of our yeah. birth, things like that. Absolutely, and I and I believe we choose the parents we have to give us the problems we have because because our lives are all about solving certain problems. But, yeah. but where we have free will is how we deal with the challenges that we're given, that we have free will with. Yeah, and the reason I ask you that question, because when you bring up I things do like believe soul, that. When, you, when you bring up things like soul planning, people who were born in poverty or people who were born to parents that beat them or, or alcoholics or whatever, they might say, well, I would never choose this circumstance. I would choose to be born wealthy. Um, but, you know, I, I love your life because it, it also presents an example. There's no perfect life, right? So you would say, someone might say, well, because let's take, for, again, we're going to keep using his name, Donald Trump. There are a lot of people who would love to trade places with Donald Trump. I would love to be born into a family of, of fame and fortune and have millions of dollars. Um, and so they would say, and I, I, I just kind of laugh. I think guy goes, you know, if you want to personalized guy like that okay i'm going to give you what you asked for you could you're going to be born you're going to be born into a wealthy family you're, you're going to have you're going to have fame you're going to have millions of dollars you'll never want for anything boom there you go and then you end up you land on like whoa wait a minute this is not what i was expecting yes exactly well i'll tell you something quite interesting um i read a book and i and i got to know him and um, I corresponded with him because I had a chapter in this book on ayahuasca, on my experiences with ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And I talked to a guy called Chris Bash, who wrote a book called um, LSD and the Mind of God. And mm -hmm. he's a professor of history and philosophy um, in the States. And, and about sort of 20 years ago, that as an experiment, to understand how the cosmos worked every two weeks for over some years that he would take massive dose of LSD, you know, as an academic to oh, wow. see, not to heal himself or to get high in a hippie way, mm -hmm. but to really expand into the cosmos and see how the cosmos worked. Interesting. And so he really got to sort of hang up there with some of the great sort of minds who um, who dictate events on the, on the cosmos. It's a fascinating book. But he said that in one of his high doses sort of cosmic consciousness sessions, he had the experience that all his lives were happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, I think, is a very interesting thing. That's becoming a more Very, common understanding, yeah. That all our lives happen at the same time. And, um, but, but again, um, unless one has personally experienced that, you know, we don't really know. But it's definitely um, a book worth sort of looking at. Yeah. Um, sort of reading, not, not, because of the LSD sort of part of it, but because of the insights that came mm -hmm. through ascending into cosmic consciousness and experiencing what goes on in those realms. Yeah, and absolutely. Beings. I'll tell you something. Yeah, no, no, you're going to say something. I'll no, go ahead. Come in. Go ahead, please. No, because just as I decided it, I realized I wouldn't say it. 
<laughs> so so you come in, Brian. Well, what I wanted to do is I, I teased at the beginning. I know you've got a vision for what you think humanity is going to go through in the next six years. Yeah. We've kind of touched on it, but I want to I want to put that question out to you because I promised the audience I would I would ask that question. So what do you what do you see us going through? I I see us as going through a collective dark night of the soul, a collective consciousness. I think that we're going to go through, and we are going through, some dark places. And that's why it behoves us all to be courageous and open-hearted and loving, because then we can circumnavigate, no, that, that we can navigate these dark places in a strong and loving place so that they don't destroy us, but they uplift us. Mm. But I think that things are going to be taken away. I think, look, all the very wealthy people on the planet, the billionaires, that they all know that if they were to just give one month, um, one year salary, that sort of poverty on the planet could be eliminated three times over. But why don't they? Because they're afraid of making the shifts. Where sort of most people know there's a lot wrong with the planet and that we need to make the quantum shift, but they can't see, conceive of anything beyond the ego consciousness. Hmm. A, and so they don't know that there's anything beyond it. And B, they don't know how to make the shift. Um, because to make a shift onto a new level, you've got to develop your consciousness. You've got to work on yourselves. So, so they are not going to give up the reality that cocoons them. Um, the sort of wealth that cocoons them, the need to own sort of billions and billions of dollars and sort of billions and billions of Picassos and, and Lucian Freud paintings. Um, they're not going to give that up, but I think that something will happen and it will be taken away. Hmm. Um, Chris Bash talks about this in his book, that he feels there's going to be a significant ecological crisis and maybe a financial crisis, which after all is certainly in the offing, you know, that the world is quadrillions in debt, how it still, how the financial system still continues to operate, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that something will happen and we'll all be put in the same boat and we'll realize that all our elitism and our and our yachts and our money and our fame and our glory is not going to help us, that we're all going to be in the same boat. Interesting. I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetimes. It may happen in 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 um in my daughter's lifetime. Hmm. But I think again I see this as what I talked about earlier, as being about fierce grace. Um, yeah. About yeah. fierce grace, because there's a divine aspect. And it's the, the parable of the prodigal son, isn't it, Brown? That that we have to lose our way to find it. And, and sort of God was happier from the one who'd lost his way and then came back into the fold than the one who'd never fallen off their pedestal in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, that's the I human tell story. You, yeah. I had a great friend from school and who was a multi multi millionaire um, in the 60s he inherited 100 million sort of, you know, dollars and in the 60s that's almost yep. a billion today. Right. And 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 he spent it on sort of, you know, on sort of crazy stuff. And in the end, he ended up a sort of hobo on the streets here. And, you know, some people like me, we had to look after him and sort of pay his rent. 
Wow. And then and then and then he got a cancer that began to eat up his face. So this beautiful, handsome playboy who had everything and was so selfish and the most beautiful women and everything, sort of lost everything. But in the end, he became the most beautiful, gracious, loving human being. And you, you know, and he smoked his last cigarette, because I was with him just before he died, he smoked his last cigarette almost before he took his last breath. Mm. His la but somehow he found himself in those last weeks of his life when mm. everything was taken away. And, and he became the most beautiful human being. And, and his death incredibly touched me. Mm. So... Um, that's really what life's about. How do you and I and all of us, how do we become, Brown, the beautiful being that we really are? How do we become the sacred divine self that is inherent in all of us? How do we strip ourselves of these false images and the and the false narratives that have guided our lives so that we find the real story of who we are that is basically um, a divine being in a human body. And we have all these temptations and we have all these challenges, but somehow I think... Um, I feel that humanity is going to pull through, is going to pull through very well. And that the divine that created the experiment of human consciousness on planet Earth, that this divine force that is both beyond us and within us, this divine force is not going to give up on the human condition. And yeah. that and that humanity is going to move into its next step. And so, so my heart is full of hope. My heart is full of joy. Great. I, I love ending on hope and joy. So I think that's a great place to, to wrap. So I'd like to do is have you, uh, you, you've mentioned your book a couple of times, but uh, give people the exact title of your book and where they can find it and where they can connect with you. Okay, guys, if you want to connect with me, <clears throat> um, just just Google my name, Serge Beddington Barons, and you can get onto my website. But my 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 email address is info at gmail.com. I N F O S E R G E B B at gmail.com. So write to me my book is amazing grace and you can get it from amazon and there's us and and please buy it because the money will go to a good cause and you'll have fun reading it and i think it can be instructive and my other book is is awakening the universal heart and my other book in my crazy convoluted little oh my other book is underneath my computer. <laughs> my computer's been sitting on it. Here's my other book. Is Gateways is, to the Soul. Inner and, Work for the Outer World. Cool. Yeah, and after every chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, after every chapter are exercises to how to get closer to the soul. And so it's a workbook. And all oh. of these books, a prophet is going to charity to help the ukrainians love that i love that well sir it's yeah great it's been great getting to know you it's been great meeting you i i feel a, a, a connection with you i i love the inspiration that you're giving to people and the work that you're doing so thanks so much for doing this today great great brian um an enormous an enormous privilege um sort of can we stay on a second after sure absolutely we yeah. go yeah great Thank you very much for having me. Brian. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Lovely. Yeah. Lots of love to you. And.